to the matter at hand. We are really pleased to have Bill Mayers here and Al Borate. We, we, did, we planned this in February, long after the book came out, but before Bill was most recently on VPR. We already had this plan, but we had bad weather. So we were ahead of the curve in that regard. Bill was raised in Texas, educated at Harvard, has been a journalist, a high school teacher, and a member of the Vermont House of Representatives. He has authored or co-authored 15 books on subjects ranging from the Marine Corps, Marine Corps, to workplace democracy, to presidential fishing, plus four books of humor with Professor Frank Bryan, including the bestseller, Real Vermonters Don't Milk Goats. <clears throat> His hobbies include running, beekeeping, singing, and fly fishing. And I think he is working on a history of beekeeping in Vermont. I have been told that. He lives in Burlington, Vermont, with his wife of 45 years, Chris Hatzel. They have two sons. Al Bowright of Middlesex is a humorist, playwright, and musician. He grew up in the Lamoille Valley and graduated from People's Academy in Morrisville, attended Harvard University, member of the class of 1968, is a Vietnam veteran as an Army officer. He earned a law degree at Suffolk University in Boston, served as a law clerk at the Vermont Supreme Court, worked as a legislative counsel for 31 years, including 25 years as senior counsel before retiring at the end of 2008. He is also the co-founder with George Woodard of the Groundhog Opry, Vermont's own version of Nashville's Grand Old Opry. The show is a feel-good throwback to a time when live music played on the radio, barn dances took place, and the general store had everything you needed, including a post office at the back of the store. Please welcome Bill and Al. How close do I have to be to this mic? Is this all right? Uh, well, just, you know, raise your hand if I get indistinct, please. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's really a great honor to be back in St. Johnsbury. It's the first place my wife and I lived in Vermont and um, almost 48 years ago. And uh, um, thanks for having us, Bob. And thanks to Al. You'll realize how funny he is uh, later on. Um, so you're twofer tonight. Um, we, we uh, Jeff Danzer and I have a finished book here with a lot of contributors such as Al and, and others, but we're also uh, doing, or I'm also doing with Don Hooper, one of the contributors, a book on the history of humor in Vermont. And uh, then I'm also uh, doing a history of beekeeping in Vermont with uh, several other beekeepers. So I'm trying to keep out of trouble that way. Um, but I'd like to start by giving you some Vermont humor context. And uh, the way we're going to organize our book is the first chapter is provisionally called, uh, well, the, chap the, the title of the book is I Could Hardly Keep From Laughing. And it's a, <laughs> a remark that Mark Twain allegedly heard in Brattleboro sometime in the late 19th century when People were, had come to listen to him talk, and he couldn't understand why they were so stone-faced. Um, and he went outside and listened to a farmer talk to his wife and said, I could hardly keep from laughing. So the first chapter is called um, The Farmer. So it's a lot of agricultural humor. And the second chapter is called The Visitor, and that's the time in the early uh, 19th to 20th century when people from away began to visit Vermont and even some of them would buy places and stay for the summer. And then the third chapter is called The Immigrant, and that's the point at which history in the 70s and 80s when the Flatlanders won. I mean, when they came in and out uh, populated the uh, natives. Um, so Frank Bryan and I wrote this book right at that moment of, of um, tension, um, and that's why we called it Real Vermonters Don't Milk Goats. And the fourth chapter is about um, um, politics and some humor from uh, which I collected when I was in the legislature and other places. And then the fifth chapter is about uh, stand-up comics uh, and performers such as um, uh, Al and um, uh, Rusty DeWeese and uh, some other people around the state. Um, 
So I'm just going to give you a flavor of some of these uh, sections as we've done them. Uh, but it begins uh, this way. Uh, Vermont humor began in hard scrabble times as farmers made light of heavy and tedious work. Active minds needed something to chew on through countless hours of plowing, of plowing rock-strewn fields, shaving and shaping stories to find points. They came up with slow breakers, fast breakers, understatements, exaggerations, even gallows humor, jokes that came on like a slow dawn and others that broke like a thunderclap. The main elements were accent, timing, subject matter, and usually it was of a rural character. Now, uh, part of growing up in Texas is this great place to be from, but it does have its own style of humor that's different from Vermont. And so Vermont's humor is much tighter and um, more uh, reflective, and the Texas humor is, of course, based on exaggeration. And um, so, for example, and. Uh, uh, these are jokes that I learned when I was a kid, um, that in Texas, uh, our town is so small that the welcome and goodbye signs are on the same post. Um, and uh, that old boy is so mean that if, the, if hell had a football team, the devil wouldn't even let him suit up. And uh, that old boy is so dumb that if brains were gasoline, he wouldn't have enough to drive an ant's motorcycle around a BB. And that old boy is so, so dumb that he still thinks that Jesus is spelled with a small g. Well, here's some Vermont jokes, okay? Somewhat less mm, bloviating. Um, an Amazon of a woman married a shrimp of a man. The next morning, a farmer driving past sees the bride shaking the sheets out of the bedroom window. He reins in the team and calls out, looking for Elmer? <laughs> Jim's wife eloped with a hired man. Not in Jim's new Ford. <laughs> At the newspaper office. How much do obituary notices cost? 50 cents an inch, ma'am. Oh, we can't afford that. Father was six feet two. And at the druggist, the wife says, you write the directions plain on the bottles. What's for my husband and what's for the horse? I can't have anything happen to the horse before spring planning's done. And a sign allegedly on a druggist store in Montpelier, hams and cigars, smoked and unsmoked. <laughs> now we've created this a fictional character called Ira. And um, so we've cast him in the role of carrying some of these stories. So Ira was not playing with a full deck. Even he admitted that. But he was proud, and he could outfox some of the bigger minds in the village. Was he smart in a stupid kind of way, or was he stupid in a smart kind of way? That was the question fellow citizens pondered. Whatever the answer, it was clear that Ira started early. Ira once bought two donuts at the local bakery, but before he ate them, he changed his mind and exchanged them for two cookies. He ate the cookies and made to leave the store. Wait a minute, young man, said the baker. You didn't pay for the cookies. But I gave you the donuts for the cookies, Ira replied. Yes, but you didn't pay for the donuts either. Didn't eat the donuts, said Ira. I was, was very proud when he got his first toothbrush. Will you have paste with it, said the druggist? Oh, no, they're not dirty. Uh, they're, not, they're dirty, but they're not loose. As Ira aged, he still couldn't get the hang of honesty. Once, when farmers were gathered at the feed store, where Ira worked very part-time, the men got into an argument over the benefits of corporal punishment in the schools. Oh, I don't believe in whipping students, said Ira. Only time I was ever licked was for telling the truth. Cured you, didn't it? <laughs> Ira had a dog named Helen Rats that stuck to him like glue. The dog had a much scarred muzzle that brought frequent queries. 
He got that for being too conscientious, Ira explained. He followed a rat into a keg of nails. The dog was, such, was a famous vermin destroyer that several merchants tried to buy from him without luck. How much you want for him, asked one of the town fathers. $50,000, that's my price, said Ira. Oh, it's too rich for me, said the man. A few days later, the man saw Ira without the dog and asked where it was. Sold it, said Ira proudly. Holy cow, how much? My price. Did you get cash? Mm, not exactly, but I do get, did get two $25,000 cats. <laughs> well, times changed. People came in, and of course you've heard uh, lots and lots of stories about the visitor uh, coming and asking the way to this town, that town, and asking what's the best thing to come out of Rutland, Route 7. Um, and um, the Texan, of course, is always Texas object, object of derision. So the Texan, and you maybe many of you heard this story. It's always one, been one of my favorites where the Texan stops and he sees a farmer out digging up rocks. And of course he sells, well, what are you doing? The farmer says through clenched jaw, digging up rocks. And the Texan says, well, where the rock, where the rocks come from? Glacier brought them. And the Texan said, well, where'd the glacier go? Back to get more rocks. <laughs> well, um, we had, uh, then there were uh, people that decided there was money to be made, or at least uh, fame to be uh, sought by standing up and repeating a lot of these very stories. And Alan Foley, as a professor at uh, Dartmouth, he went around collecting stories in the uh, Windsor County and uh, around. And he wrote a couple of books about that. And uh, Danny Gore, up here, superintendent of schools, Norman Lewis, he, he created this character of, um, of Danny Gore. Um, and he was always out during elections, and sometimes not during elections. But um, he, he was great. I mean, and, and he was also very, um, uh, Al's going to talk about some of the things he does in Groundhog Opry. But, but uh, Danny Gore, Norman Lewis, was really good about it, bringing a stack of newspapers to a speech, and he would pull them out, and he'd have witticisms all about stuff that was just yesterday or the day before. He was very quick at that, and, and he made a sort of a second um, profession, if not a second income, by being Danny Gore. Um, well, then along comes uh, lots and lots of foreigners, uh, including myself and my wife, um, um, Flatlanders, uh, and um, Frank Bryan, who was teaching at UVM, and um, he, he came to me, or we were at a book signing, and he said, forget about serious books. Um, someone should do a book called Real Vermonters Don't Milk Goats. And this was right after another book came out that's called Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. And I said to Frank, look, that's a great idea. You go home and think of 25 one-liners, and I'll go home and think of 25 one-liners, and we'll meet at the Oasis Diner in Burlington tomorrow, uh, Monday and see what we got. And he did, and I did, and we did, and the book came out in about three months. And, uh, and it was a bestseller, but not because we were so smart or so insightful. It just struck the right chord of, of people, really intense or at least amused, bemused by the shift in population uh, in, the, in the state. And it was also, Madeline Kunin was elected the next year as governor. Um, so we, we did a number of um, lists and, qu and quizzes, and I'll just give you one of them. Uh, how do you know when real Vermonters like you? Only real flatlanders can know the glow that comes when they discover that a real Vermonter likes them. Here are a few signs that bliss may be near. They invite you in through the kitchen door. They don't call you before they come to visit. They don't ask you if you'd rather have decaf coffee. They don't remind you to put on your snow tires. They don't come to visit during, sorry, they don't come to visit 
during the first day of deer season or the first day of trout season. Any Sunday afternoon in October or until the driveway dries in April. They don't offer you extra vegetables from their garden. And when they see you, they don't say any of the following. How's the family? Or we got to get together sometime when things settle down a bit. Or how's by you? They don't call you to tell you to cover the tomatoes. And they don't offer to help unless you need it. Well, um, then the, one of the ne next books we, we did was about um, Vermont seceding from the Union. Um, it's called Out, the Vermont Secession Book. We won't make that mistake again. So that was sort of pure political satire, but wasn't, wasn't too pointed. It wasn't like the full Vermont. Um, and then we did a book about political humor, and I'll just give you a couple of examples from that. Um, Tom Salmon, governor, uh, and Gilly Godnick, who was a senator from Rutland County, were two right-of-center Democrats. And they stumbled and tripped over ideas and images. And uh, Godnick did it so often that these malapropisms were called Gilliisms. And they were things like, well, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Or there's a rotten egg in every barrel of apples. Uh, or uh, someone asked him about what the polls were going to say about the coming election. He says, I don't believe in the polls. I want to know what the voters do when they go behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and Salmon, uh, Salmon also had Salmonisms. And his most famous one was when, in a moment of um, political um, excitement, he, he uh, said that education is the fourth leg of the tripod of the Vermont economy. Um, so um, we come to, at least now, we come, I mean, that the evening is the full Vermont. And um, so I want to turn somewhat serious about that, even though this was an effort to ride the knife edge between humor and uh, serious stuff. And so I'd like to, if I can read um, the, the opening of this, because it really tells how this came about. And um, are you in my book? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Shortly after I had open heart surgery, in the fall of 2016. Donald Trump's election was the nightmarish present I received on my birthday. Like millions of other Democrats and some Republicans, including my brother, I went into denial. How could 63 million people be so wrong? During the campaign, I had reread the Sinclair Lewis novel, It Can't Happen Here, about a right-wing presidential victory Little did I expect that this book, written and set in Vermont in 1935, would be so prescient. Now we would have a presidential buffoon, a man of willful ignorance, bigotry, and prejudice, a malignant narcissist who lacked all curiosity, compassion, and humility. Upon further reflection, I saw that the Republicans had done it with the help of Russian hacking, the antiquated electoral college, widespread gerrymandering, and appeals to the worst human instincts. As I recovered physically, I deteriorated mentally. I got angrier and angrier. I couldn't march because of my heart. I had no complaints to voice about our Vermont congressional delegation. Okay, I could send a check to the ACLU or 350.org, but that wasn't enough. I sought comfort from my friends in Vermont and beyond. Among them was Jeff Danziger, a cartoonist whom I'd known for 40 years and who had illustrated four of my books. He splits his time between Vermont and New York City. With his, <clears throat> with his biting political cartoons, he daily afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. While we commiserated, he said, well, why not write another book before dementia sets in? Hmm, I thought of what Rachel Maddow had said a few weeks earlier. Think of what you do well and do it for the country. Hmm, well, I can write humor. But I told Jeff, I'm only going to do it with you. So Jeff came right back with the title, How About the Full Vermont? Vermont in the Age of Trump. The next day, the idea still had luster. 
Jeff and I began to scour the hills and hollows for ideas. Vermont has withstood the revolution, a New York invasion, the New Hampshire land grants, and will assuredly survive the next few years under the Washington axis of evil, a.k.a. the Trump administration, the Republicans in Congress, and conservatives on the Supreme Court. Vermont is the, was the first state to outlaw slavery. We banned billboards and went to great lengths to protect our natural resources. From Matthew Lyon to Ralph Flanders, Vermont has a history of speaking truth to, to tyranny. We're little, but we're loud. <clears throat> Look how we elected a New Yorker, Bernie Sanders, to represent us in the United States Senate and carry our message nationwide. <clears throat> Vermont gave refuge to the Soviet dissident and Nobel Prize winner, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Trump is apparently ready to put our entire country in Russia's hand as Putin plays Trump's ego like Yo-Yo Ma plays the Stradivarius. The result is that the world's democracies are no longer looking to the United States for global leadership. A shocking abdication already underway due to Trump's refusal to protect American people from foreign enemies. Jeff and I made a good start on the book with some lists and quizzes and cartoons and a cover. Vermont, Vermonters fight back, always have, always will. However, we soon realized that our task was too great and the enemy too fearsome for us to do it alone. As in most hostage situations, and this was the biggest one in the nation's history, we needed backup. We went looking for wise, witty, and like-minded friends to make up a posse of Vermont writers and artists. In a month, we'd signed up almost a score of people with kindred, righteous anger. Our duet became a chorus. Hallelujah. And indeed, uh, I mean, if you look on the cover, we got an incredible range of people in a matter of six weeks. And um, so uh, I, I'm proud of having helped this to happen. I'm not, you know, it's not my book or it's not Jeff's book. It's, it's our book. And among them is uh, Al. Um, and uh, so I'd like to uh, <coughs> ask him to take over for a while and tell about some of your background and what you're trying to do with grounding. Because we, we thought that we needed some hu outright humor, but still with pointed messages. And then there's some very serious stuff in here. It has no humor whatsoever. So it's a real um, bouillabaisse of, of um, approaches to Trump from different Vermonters. Okay. You want to stand or sit? Uh, I'll stand. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, I don't know if any of you have, have been a victim of the Groundhog Opry uh, or, uh, or not. It's, it's a show, let's see, a bunch of these are mine. Oh, sir. <laughs> um, it's a show that was designed by my partner, George Woodard, um, who did it a number of years on his own on Groundhog Day weekend. And um, it, it ends up, it's a fake radio show. And it's a, it's a good setup for a humorist because We've got an alternative reality, a different world that he created. It's, it's not unlike the Prairie Home Companion, uh, though George had never, had never listened to the Prairie Home Companion. But we created sort of a, mainly he created an alternate universe that, that, that we pull out, we, we pull out every so often in the spring when people are totally desperate for something to laugh at. Uh, and we tour it, we've toured it, I don't know, 12 or 13 different times, five or six, seven shows a year or something. And part of it, uh, Bill's talking about Vermont humor, and uh, a lot of what we're doing, lot, at least what we're doing, uh, isn't quite as well boiled down as, as you know, the, the old one, the old one-liners of the, of the non-talkative Vermonter. Um, but we, um, between news items and advertisements, um, you, you, can, you can cover a lot of ground. We also do 
fake versions of like uh, the bird show. Uh, the WDEV in Waterbury has has had bird experts, and so we did a show called What the Bird Do. Um, but quite often, w what I do is I, I take a list of, of sort of issues that are current and then play around with them. And uh, a bottomless source of, of material is, well, I'm a news junkie, so um, a lot of it is, is current. Um, but technology, as technology advances, there's, there's vast, vast opportunities to, to play with stuff. And I'll, I'll do, uh, I'll do a, a couple of pieces from, uh, that we did in the Groundhog Opry in 2017. And, uh, maybe I'll do it in, I play the, George plays a character called Roland Uphill. And I do his sidekick, uh, Kneel Down. And uh, so maybe I'll do, I'll do a piece in a little bit of his accent. In the wake of WikiLeaks' disclosure that the CIA is able to watch us all on our smartphones, tablets, random appliances, and television sets, Listeners should join the movement to gross out your TV. Step one, every time you turn the TV on or off or simply walk by it, moon it up close and personal. Step two, every time you use the toilet, bring your phone along and keep it trained on whatever the action is. Step three, hook up your phone charger inside a garbage can. Step four, watch TV with no pants on. And in general, if you got anything nasty going on, make sure your device sees it. Foot rock, jock itch, or if you're throwing up, cleaning up dog poop, hauling a dead cow out of the barn, whatever. If it's bad enough to gross you out, it's good enough to share. Be on guard for all opportunities to gross out your TV. And while you're at it, moon your microwave. Show your electric can opener how bad an open can can look and make your toaster oven hope it never sees another sticky bun. This has been a public service announcement. <laughs> so, so that was, of course, brought on by, the, by WikiLeaks and the, the news that, that they're able to watch us in our homes. Um, another one, in... Uh, Early in the year, the New York Times has a, a special, that, um, an article that shows some of the recent inventions. Uh, and um, one of the things they had was, <laughs> well, let me, this is based on fact. Let me, ju let me just, just go, go through it. It's, it's intelligent clothing. And uh, this is, so let me, let me just do it. This part of the show was brought to you by the men's department of Hardly Hardware Store, which today unveiled their new line of smart clothing featuring the GPS savvy Smarty Pants. Using Bluetooth and any phone with GPS, any child of 12 or more can teach you how to chart a route for your urban pedestrian navigation experience. And you can just put that phone away. The Smarty Pants will lead you, lead you there automatically, tugging you to the left or to the right when it's time to turn. Now you can read the failing New York Times while walking to work. The pants come with a vibrator option for those who would rather be vibrated than tugged. Our research team does not recommend wearing Smarty Pants if your route requires you to go up more than three floors in an elevator as the signal the pants employ for such a route was felt to be far too intrusive. Now, Smarty Pants can be programmed to guide you to your children, to attack threatening dogs. Men's models can ask for directions, light cigars, and make mixed drinks. Do not put Smarty Pants on if it is raining, as they have been known to short circuit, causing severe shock. If, you caught, if you're caught in a sudden shower while wearing these pants, they must be removed at once. Be on the lookout for overheating, as a hot dog frying attachment has been known to self-activate. 
In certain atmospheric conditions, the pants may act like a huge shortwave radio antenna with the zippers vibrating so as to produce searing sound that you cannot turn down. If the pants are letter hosen with the characteristic two zippers, the searing sound may be in stereo. Ask our sales force if Smarty Pants may be right for you. That's Smarty Pants at Hardly Hardware Store. Drop by today if you can find the place without your Smarty Pants. So that's, that was actually, um, they do have, they do have pants that, that tug you. So you don't have to walk around with your iPhone. It'll, it'll turn right or turn left. And they also had, I'll, I'll do one more uh, based on modern gadgets. Um, they have the icon. Now I read, I read about this in the Times. It's like a Fitbit for sex. <clears throat> they really have it. So here, this part of the show was brought to you by the adults only aisle over to the Hardly Hardware store. Drop in today and check out the smart condom. Yes, folks, we have in stock the icon, the ring that works like a Fitbit for sex. It measures and records calories burnt, frequency, duration, and all manner of other unnecessary statistics. You can recharge it by hooking it up to your computer with a mini SOB card, or you can just stick it in your car's cigarette lighter hole. Most bigly, you can upload the info and put it all on your Facebook page. Sales of this product surged when the product was first released, and as, competitive, as competition stiffened, the company had a growth spurt. Recent indications are that sales softened and almost petered out completely following Hardly Hardware's release of a competing product, the so-called Sailor's Wife app. The adults-only aisle at Hardly Hardware proudly offers the Sailor's Wife app, which enables the user to hack the smart condom of the spouse. And in the event the unit is used in the absence of the spouse, it offers several remote remedies. The first option is called the five alarm call, which activates any residential or commercial fire alarm located within 300 meters of the icon. This is especially effective in apartment buildings. Other more severe hacker remedies are designated the hangman's noose, the ring of fire, and the burning bush. The promotional literature fails to explain any of the details of how these last three options work, and our product testers decline to become testees and refuse to learn the hard way. So with a hint of mystery in the air, come over to Hardly Hardware and check out the iCondom and the Sailor's Wife app. So that's, uh, and then of course there are the political, uh, this one came up uh, in the middle of, well, you can see what the news was. Manafort and Flynn's impeachment ice cream. Try it today with a white Russian base, a whiff of turkey whipped into a spicy froth and frozen in time. Though its essential benefits all have been removed, it leaves a suspicious taste in your mouth and its critics have all mysteriously disappeared. According to the White House, it's either this ice cream or none at all. This is the only ice cream leaving the station. So anyway, um, that's sort of a, a touch of uh, sort of are reflecting the news and exaggerating it and 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 running it with it. Okay, so uh, we're going to switch gears, and he's going to make another reappearance. I mean, another appearance later on, maybe two, three. But um, just so you know, there's there's serious stuff in here. Haviland Smith, <clears throat> the retired CIA space station chief who has worked in Prague, Berlin, Langley, Beirut, and Tehran, primarily on issues related to the Soviet Union. He also served as chief of the counterterrorism staff and as executive assistant to the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. He's a graduate of Exeter, Dartmouth College, and the University of London. Uh, he served in the US Army and the United States Army Security Agency before joining the CIA. He lives in Williston. Um, and uh, I got to know him because uh, my, my uh, college roommate and he were, they both served in the, in the agency and my roommate said, get a hold of, him. he's a really good guy. And so we asked him to write a piece uh, about Trump. 
And uh, so this is, this is his um, essay. It's entitled, Trump Supports Order at Any Cost. And maybe in the current light, it supports disorder at any cost, but in any case. <clears throat> and uh, this is the introductory um, piece. Um, in uh, 1954, Senator Ralph Flanders of Vermont led the move to censure Senator Joseph McCarthy, R. Wisconsin, for his abuse of two senatorial committees investigating his conduct of personal attacks and wild accusations about domestic enemies. Said Flanders, were the junior senator from Wisconsin in the pay of the communists, he could not have done a better job for them. In the following essay, another Vermonter, Havlin Smith, calls to account uh, the far more powerful authoritarian and conspiratorialist Senator or pr President Donald Trump. America has new leadership. Our new president has probably compulsively and inadvertently given us a crystal clear picture of what he really is and of his likes and dislikes. He has shared his views about the world leaders with whom the United States must deal and in the process has told us why he likes them and the kind of behavior he admires. What he has told us is that first and foremost, he admires strong men who seize power and exercise it in whatever way is necessary to maintain it, whether legal, morally acceptable, or not. Unlike past American presidents, he somehow feels compelled to publicly express his admiration for a group of foreign leaders whose activities are so questionable that they would never have been praised by any of his predecessors. The list of these presidentially praised and admired is endless. It includes primarily those who, at best, have terrible human rights records and employ what in this country would be seen as extrajudicial methods in order to maintain their power. His favorites begin with Vladimir Putin of Russia and continue with Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines, Abdel Fattel Saeed al-Sisi of Egypt, Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey. In addition, he's spoken admiringly, particularly in terms of control they've exercised over their people of Iraq's Saddam Hussein, Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, Syria's Bashar al-Assad, and China's Jiang Xiaoping. Why would any president of the United States openly deal with, invite here for a visit, or speak positively of such a group? Could it possibly be that they represent precisely what our president would like to be, a powerful autocrat? What sort of intellectual, moral, and ethical environments do these attitudes set for members of his administration and the rest of the country? He has given us this privileged look at his own personal modus operandi and has told us by inference the way he would like to deal with our country. It might be wiser for us to recognize that we have a new leader who quite possibly does not share our constitutional attachment to American ideals. This could represent a very real threat to many of the things in which we believe are critical to the democratic future of our country. And who is this man? What is he really like? We've gotten a view of him through his own actions and statements that should well give us reasons for concern. The president has shown himself to be a sexist and religious bigot. He has further been described as immature, self-centered, spoiled, insecure, hypersensitive, impetuous, crass, crude, pompous, thoughtless, and autocratic. And on top of all that, he would appear to have difficulty telling objective truth from his own self-generated, self-serving fictions. The result of all this is that we are beginning to see on a national level a new interpersonal behavior modeled on the president's behaviors. We seem to be leaving behind the old thoughtful and civil ways in favor of this new crass presidential model. We are moving forward with the concept that if the president can think, do, or say these things, why can't we? If that turns out to be the model for our future interpersonal behavior, God help America and Vermont. So um, he wrote this, you know, maybe a year ago, and I... I don't know how much has changed. I got it worse, but that's only my opinion. Okay, Al, you want to bring some more humor to this? You want, you want to play? Uh, sure, I'm going to do that. Uh, yeah. um, why did I do this? 
Oh, okay. That'd be all right. Yeah, but they have to buy a book before they can follow it. You just you just play it, but speak, but sing articulately. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> Uh, this is Trump's version of my way. called High Noon in Highgate. The federal government is not the only entity that can build a wall. Fortunately, we in Vermont will only need about 45 miles long across the border with Massachusetts. In the north, we have our friends, the Quebecois. On the east, we have the Connecticut River. On our west, we are guarded by Lake Champlain. Our wall will be built with hedgerows of kale, genetically modified to be eight feet tall. It will be a bipartisan effort from Republican Governor Phil Scott, a contractor, 
and Democratic Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, an organic farmer. Sorry, David, this GMO is for a good cause. Vermont will become a refuge for folks from both blue and red states, fleeing from polluted waters, fouled air, and never-ending Trump rallies. Each year, we will admit a certain number of people with needed skills, giving preference to disillusioned Trump supporters. Our own EB-5 program will be scandal-free. For everybody else, because we don't want to be inhospitable, after all, Vermont was called the beckoning country back in the 1960s. We will invite, even encourage them to invest in Vermont by buying some land. Tom Salmon, a good governor in tough times, famously said, Vermont is not for sale. Well, we'll have to revise that for our own time of troubles. Get a place in Vermont will be our slogan. That place will be about 100 square inches, slightly bigger than a hand or boot print. Thus, there will be about 60,000 plots in an acre. And with 5.6 million acres of the state, we'll have a land bank of some 30 billion places in Vermont. We could sell four to every person in the universe and still have enough for ourselves. The mind boggles at the thought of it. Want to have a quiz? See how good you are? Well, let's try you. I have to get the right answer myself. Okay. This is a citizenship test at the border. Okay. Just raise your hand. Don't shout out the answer. Okay. On a particular January 31st, Ida M. Fuller of Ludlow received $22.34. Thus, she became America's first... Social Security recipient, 1933, I think. Um, okay. Which of the following <laughs> did the Vermont legislature designate as the official um, state pie? A, chicken pot. B, pumpkin. C, cow. D, apple. C, 3.1456788338. Answer? Apple. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, <clears throat> in which of the following does Vermont exceed New Hampshire? Population? Height of its mountains? Area? Number of state legislators? Area. 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 Um, Who won the American Civil War? Grant? Sherman, Standard, or Lincoln? Standard. Standard. Why? Gettysburg. Yeah, but what are you doing, Gettysburg? Outplaying the Confederate. Okay, good. Take a charge. Take a charge, yeah, okay. Okay, um, the Revolutionary War battle fought entirely in Vermont was the Battle of A. Bennington, B. St. Albans, C. Canaan, D. E. Hubbardson. Hubbardson? Okay, which Vermont governor was born in Vermont? Howard Dean, Peter Shumlin, Madeline Cunin, Jim Douglas, Richard Snelling. Peter Shumlin. You're right. <laughs> You've already read this quiz. You're cheating. I didn't look it up, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, name the Vermont. Are these going to be on the census? <laughs> They'll be on the test. Name, name the Vermont state vegetable. The Sheffield potato, the gill feather turnip, the Bennington collard greens, the boiled pinto beans, and Sharon sweet onion. Turn it again. Sheffield potato, gill feather turnip, Bennington collard greens, the boiled pinto beans, Sharon sweet onion. Turn it. The turnip, skill feather turnip, Wordsboro. They have a they have a turnip festival every year at Wordsboro. Anyone know where Wordsboro is? <laughs> South. I mean, it's just near uh, Wilmington. Uh, okay. 
This, this is really tough. I didn't even get this one. Okay. So you want to pair, I'm going to read these state models. Let's see how many you can get. Here, these are, these are one, two, three, six state models. Okay. Live free or die, six Simper Tyrannus, liberty and prosperity, freedom and unity, in God we trust, and by valor and arms. And then I'm going to read you the states. And we'll see how well you do. Okay, the states are not in order, of course. Virginia, Mississippi, New Hampshire, Florida, New Jersey, Vermont. Okay, so who wants to do the easy two first? Okay. Yeah. The answer is the Florida, okay. And Vermont? Okay. All right. Anybody want to take a guess on any of those others? Okay, we have, we have remaining six Simper Tyrannus, Liberty and Prosperity, In God We Trust, and By Valor and Arms, and the remaining states are Virginia, Mississippi, Florida, New Jersey. Tyrannus must be Virginia. Hmm? Tyrannus must be Virginia. I'm, I'm sure it is. Yep, yep, it is. Six, six Simper Tyrannus of Virginia, okay? What else? One state has In God We Trust. Um, I don't even know myself, so I'm going to look it up. Um, <laughs> see. Now, Liberty and Prosperity is New Jersey. And, and uh, yeah, E in God We Trust is um, Florida. Valor and Arms is Mississippi, if you think. Okay, um, okay here's one that uh, we borrowed from Frank. This is always. Name, I'm going to list towns and counties, and you listen for the ones that are discordant and the ones that don't belong. Addison Town, Addison County. Chittenden Town, Chittenden County. Nope. All right. Orange Town, Orange County. Wyndham Town, Wyndham County. Rutland Town, Rutland County. Franklin Town, Franklin County. Essex Town, Essex County. Windsor Town, Windsor County. Washington Town, Washington County, Bennington Town, Bennington County, Grand Isle Town, Grand Isle County, Orleans Town, Orleans County. Essex. Essex. Essex is right. Okay, I mean, Essex is one of the three. There's one more. Chittenden. Yeah. Chittenden is in Rockland County. Good. What's the third one? Third one was Essex. Essex Town is in Chittenden County. And Essex County, of course, is over here. Sure. Yeah. And then there's, and then Chittenden is in Rutland County. And Washington uh, is in Orange County. It's not in Washington County. Okay, Justin Morgan worked in Randolph as a, a blacksmith, B, schoolmaster, C, income keeper, D, newspaper editor, E, farmer. Frozen, 
what becomes of a hot spot when you get old. Cell tower, the prison where the French held Richard the Lionheart. Mouse arrest. When Richard the Lionheart had lost his computer privileges while still in the cell tower. Four bars, three sheets of the wind. <laughs> Offload. When Richard the Lionheart had Googled his French captors at four bars and complained of his frozen hot spots, they agreed to carry Uncle Mort's malware for him. <laughs> Geek. A technically savvy Greek. Website. Where you have to stand and get a good view of the huge spider web under the back porch. Spyware. Camo outfit of choice for peeping toms. Webcam. What you might end up with is the Greek spider in the back porch is a geek as well as a peeping tom. <laughs> Total system-wide crash. When grandma grabs all the personal electronic devices, webcams, and other modern electronics in the entire house, wraps them up in a tablecloth, ties a knot, and throws the bundle in the nearest portal. <laughs> system-wide crash. Okay. Okay, you all, uh, you all know who Jay Craven is. Well, this is written by his son, Jasper. And this is a letter from Trump to the Vermont Congressional Delegation. White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. <coughs> Short, uh, 2009, May 10th, right? <clears throat> May 10th, 2017. Two Vermont's three... <clears throat> illustrious congressman. It is with great pleasure that Melania and I seek your presence at my first congressional picnic as president to be held on June 22nd on the White House lawn. Please feel free to bring your lovely family members. Food and drink will be served. I look forward to meeting with you all during the festivities and conversing about the common good ground we can find to make America great again. While I know we don't see eye to eye on many matters, I have a great deal of respect for the state of Vermont and its constituents. Yours is a state of transcendent beauty with rolling hills and peaceful waters. Your air is sweet. Your soil is rich. But it's no Manhattan, believe me. My towers touch the sky and rip into the clouds. In Burlington, your wimpy mayor, Wiener or something, can barely get approval for a 160-foot redevelopment of the Church Street Mall. That would be Vermont's tallest building? 160 feet? Please, I have a boat longer than that. As you all know, I visited Burlington during my presidential campaign. Performed at the Tin Theater. Beautiful venue, but no Car Carnegie Hall. Stuffy place, really. Not classy. There were thousands of people lined up outside to see me in Burlington. And, and that was in the dark, desolate, cold of winter. It was so frigid that night, minus 30 degrees. My people tell me there were 40,000 people who received tickets for my rally. More people than live in all of Caledonia County. A whole, a whole county to see me. And on a night when it was so cold, I heard that people's Subarus didn't even start. You people in Vermont love Subarus. Japanese cars? Please, give me a vehicle with stamina, energy, elegance. But overall, Vermont is a gorgeous place. Huge. It's a state brimming with... <clears throat> innovative entrepreneurs and fledgling businesses that are in reinventing what it is, what can be produced in a small rural state. I particularly like to praise Ariel Quiros and Bill Stenger, two of the best titans of business in the state. Tremendous people. Quiros especially. He used his hard-earned cash to purchase a $2 million condo at Trump Tower. One of my best condos, I'm told. Those two really have the business acumen of a New York real estate king like me. I'm sure they both read The Art of the Deal, my second favorite book after the Bible. I presume Quiros and Stinger paid particular attention to the following real quote from the book. The final key to the way I promote is bravado. I play to people's fantasies. People may not always think big themselves, but they can still get very excited by those who do. That's why a little hyperbole never hurts. People want to believe that something is the biggest and the greatest and the most spectacular. I call it truthful hyperbole. It's an innovative form of exaggeration and a very effective 
form of promotion. In addition to Stinger and Quiros, your state has some other great businessmen and women. But Ben and Jerry's? Losers. Overrated. Fish food is garbage. Total trash. Those ice cream people supported Bernie for president. A communist. Bernie, you got guts. If you cross me in 2020, I will bring in the big guns. It will be all over before it started. My people will be watching you at the picnic, so don't get any ideas. I heard that during past presidential picnics, you've stolen large vats of coleslaw to redistribute to the 1%. Not good, pathetic. As for Pat Leahy, you are a man worthy of great respect. The most senior senator in the chamber with more than four decades of public service? But don't, I don't appreciate your tough questioning of Attorney General Jeff Sessions during his confirmation hearings. You were so eagerly looking to take the spotlight. Sad. I look forward to speaking with you, U.S. Senator, U.S. Representative Peter Welch at the picnic. I have heard you <clears throat> worked with the esteemed House Speaker Paul Ryan in the past on cheese legislation. Good. I enjoyed our March conversation on negotiating <clears throat> drug prices. You made some good points, as did I. The pharmaceutical CEOs I've recently met with have also made some good points on health care policy. The head of Novartis is a member of mar a lago home of the best coleslaw on the plate. Don't get any ideas, Bernie. The Johnson & Johnson CEO actually owns a summer home in Vermont and has a great joke about the state. What's the best thing to come out of Rutland? Route 7. Rutland does have some trouble, and, we, and an opioid crisis is very bad. I'm very happy that our Muslim ban was able to prevent 100 Syrian refugees from entering the city. The previous mayor, I call him Chris Losers, should not have so vigorously defended the resettlements. He lost because of it. Pathetic. Anyway, I look forward to the Vermont delegation's presence at the picnic. No backpacks, Bernie. Thank you again for your service to our country. You each bring an impressive energy to your political efforts in Washington, but not as much energy as me. Believe me, sincerely, <coughs> Donald Trump. Um, you got another one? What do you think, Bill? I mean, uh, yeah, Bob. <laughs> Bill. That's my name. What do you want? Well, I don't know. What do people want? I mean, we can read more. I mean, or we can Any take your complaints or questions or... Uh, Hmm? Question, comment, joke. Stand up and stretch. <laughs> yeah. Have I met the president? No. I've met presidents, but not this one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I met Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy so one, one evening when our singing group was singing in the White House. And, um, but that was like five second handshake. But I did get to I get to get the I did get to shake up. Let's see, George Bush Sr. shook his hand and then uh, uh, and I was invited to the White House correspondence dinner uh, with Obama in 2012 when he was Obama's brother. And um, so I did get actually to shake his hand and tell him how much he and I both revered Rhino Nebor, theologian and and uh, then I, uh, I got a nice sign, a large graph picture. So that was good. There were good things. I'm sorry? There were some good things that had no return. Well, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah. Did you work? Did you work? With um, Bernie though? With who? Bernie, Bernie, Bernie Sanders. Do we work with him? Uh, no. Did, did, well, we got him to, we got him to, to write a blurb, but I mean, it was one of his staffers, but that was great. You know, they all wrote blurbs, and then we even found this one. Uh, this is the worst book ever in the history of the world. Total failure, sad, at the real Donald Trump. So we simply made that up. <laughs>
Anything in, in, anything in here that you Any more songs like my way? Uh, well, not quite like my way, but I do have some other songs. Uh, what are your other songs? You want to hear other songs? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I want to hear other songs. Okay. I'm even going to go sit down. Um, so, as you heard, I, I worked at the legislature for 31 years. Long years. And every, uh, every spring, they have a cabaret where, uh, where they really get up and, and go after each other. And some of them are really funny people. You know, uh, the whole spectrum of the legislators, they're all different types of people, but each of them has some ability to communicate uh, with, with human beings, which is why they get elected. And many of them have great senses of humor. And uh, so um, uh, Peter Shumlin and Mary Sullivan were like co-anchors on a fake news news show. And Peter, both of them were just, just very funny. A lot of insider humor. You know, every year, uh, it features things that were going on in the legislature. And one year, uh, they had a, a big bill on ancient roads because uh, people would have houses, etc., and then they discover an ancient road uh, that had been disused, or and the town still owned it, and it's going right through the property. And so, insurance companies got involved and bankers and and so pretty soon you've got to have curative legislation so so the legislature had to deal with the situation of finding ancient roads on people's property and and what do you do and what they said was we'll give you a certain number of years to locate them and after that we're going to we're going to say they're oblivious so um so I, I tend to um, take songs that, um, that exist and warp the words to, to fit whatever the situation was, uh, was happening in, in, during the year. And so this is a song that I came up with the year that Ancient Roads was a big legislative legislative issue.
Vincent Aluzzi. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he was uh, on the institutions committee, the chair of the institutions committee, for many years, and uh, had a lot of input. Um, he a lot of things. He had a lot of ideas, and a lot of them went through. And one of his ideas was to have the inmates answer the tourist hotline. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that old marine. I hear them tourists call. I ain't had such fun. I ain't had such a ball since I was in prison. On phone calls I have made. I do my heavy breathing while others stay out. Well, this is short. Okay, this is uh, confidence among the rocks. It's a great phrase from the um, theologian. Um, oh God, was it? He was a he was a guy at Yale. Um, the name of one of their houses. Um, and he he came and preached all around um, New England. But he talked about Yankees as having confidence among the rocks. So this is the Vermont toolbox. Vermonters are not defenseless against Trump. We have a long history of inventiveness and gadgetry. The Vermont, the Vermont saying still applies to Vermonters. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. So these tools will help us get through the next four years and now the next three years. A lie detector. There's only one setting, lies, and the needle points, the needle points to it constantly and or goes off as soon as he begins to speak. Needle nose pliers for extracting tiny lies. It's rarely used. Backyard manure spreader for what flows like lava from the White House. This machine runs perpetually on methane from the manure. 
duck and cover manual. To duck and cover was the government's suggestion for how individuals should respond to a surprise nuclear attack. An official 1951 U.S. civil defense film, Duck and Cover, was intended primarily for children. The proper way to duck and cover is demonstrated by Bert the Turtle. Audience Raspberry Meter for measuring the outrage about Trump's lie of the day. Hearing aids minus the batteries for giving Trump fans the impression that you're listening. A moral compass. Take it near the White House and watch it spin right out of its case. A Vermont Army knife, not to be confused with a Swiss Army knife. The Vermont version of this iconic tool is considerably more practical. It consists of both large and small razor-sharp blades that can be used to shred Trump's numerous lies. The course school, school is invaluable for twisting and turning his words into hope of finding a semblance, semblance of truth and and not that it will ever not that it will ever happen. The solid gold toothpick is a must for eliminating tiny bits and pieces of Trump's bad food served at Mar a Lago. The special tweezers can be used to extract the minuscule pieces of truth from the truckload of lies. A long timer stick, as in Vietnam, where soldiers made uh, made notches to keep track of their days in country until they flew home safely. This one made of Vermont ash or maple will carry you through 2020. A copy of the Vermont Constitution, the fundamental body of laws which has served Vermont well, first as an independent nation from 1777 to 1791, and with a few changes as a state since then. Thanks a lot. And, um,